ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the NFL tonight. We have Steven Hughes, Nick Rice, and Robert Deers on top here for all the information about NFL. You have NFC Championship, AFC Championship, the newest headlines for head coaches for the two teams. Nick Rice is our host. Let's start it off, Nick. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome inside the NFL Tonight Studios. I'm your host, Nick Rice, alongside Stephen Hughes and Robert Dieters, two of the most informative NFL analysts alive. We are here simulcast live on Spreaker.com's National Sports, led by our very own commissioner, Robert Dieters, and Stephen Hughes is also on tap as well. I'm your host, Nick Rice, uh, going on four hours of sleep. Man, it's been a long and grueling Saturday as we are getting prepared for championship weekend. We start off uh, with some two with two of the top headlines I've seen really ever. These uh, these matchups, I am really impressed. I mean, you, you just don't know what you're going to get out of these two games, and that's what makes uh, the NFL so terrific. We have Robert Dieters and Stephen Hughes both on tap. We will start with the coaching carousel. It all started a few weeks ago on what was called Black Monday, where all these coaches uh, got fired, and the scramble for their new head man uh, for eight of these franchises began, and Kansas City was the first to snatch their new head man Andy Reid. We will start off with Stephen Hughes. Uh, was this a positive addition to the Kansas City locker room? This was uh, record-wise the worst team in the NFL. They have number one overall pick. Is the Andy Reid-led Chiefs on their way to success in the National Football League? I think they are. I think that um, it might take a year or two for them to build, but uh, obviously with five pro bowlers this year, uh, obviously a surprise from the worst team in the league and the number one overall pick. Andy Reid really has a lot on his plate to get things started and to get this team on the right direction. And they need a quarterback. They need a different quarterback. The quarterback situation has been a problem. But they have the running back in Jamal Charles. They have the wide receiver in Dwayne Bow, And they have a pretty solid defense. They need to be more consistent. But I feel like they, the defense could be one of the best. And their offense is the biggest concern. They can get that up with the help of Andy Reid. And I feel like the Chiefs are going to be on the right road with sticking with Andy Reid as their uh, new head coach. The, the Kansas City Chiefs led the entire NFL in turnovers committed last season uh, with a new head coach and a mentality for success. I believe that will be a much different outcome uh, this coming year. Buffalo snatches just two days after the Reed hiring. Uh, the Buffalo Bills hired a former Syracuse head coach. Nobody really heard of this guy until he finally becomes a member of the Buffalo Bills. He is uh, He was... Uh, had a less than dazzling 26 and 26 record in his four years uh, at Syracuse. And Robert Dieters, what are your thoughts on a new Buffalo hiring? They used to have a longtime head coach there for the Buffalo Bills. They move on to Doug Marone. What are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are I think the Bills can uh, improve. So it's going to take a couple of years to get them situated. I think the defense really needs most of the work right now. C.J. Stiller probably the biggest player for that Bills organization right now. So when you look at it, I think the Bills just need to improve the next season. And, you know, in two seasons, I think they're going to be in uh, – I think they're going to be playoff contenders. And obviously, this was a coaching carousel. The, uh, I mean, if you're talking about a team, uh, there's so many teams that had a mentality to rebuild house. And some of these teams went straight for the general manager position. Others went to the coach position. Others took both of those spots. And only one team, the Cleveland Browns, they cleaned entire house. New GM, new head coach. Uh, they got a new coordinator as well and a new owner during the middle of last season. And the Cleveland Browns at the head coaching spot hire a guy uh, by the name of Rod Chudinski. Not very familiar with that name. Just a week ago, they hired this new, uh, this new head coach. He was a former Carolina offensive coordinator. Back to Stephen Hughes. What are your thoughts on this new hiring for one of the worst teams in a long time in the NFL? Obviously, um, they went with someone that um, you know has a lot of experience on the offensive end and. Uh, the offense is pretty shaky this year for the Browns, you know. They do have two rookies that were the starting 
quarterback and the starting running back. You have Trent Richardson at Alabama this year. He has some knee problems going into the going into the uh, training camp, and obviously that was a concern for the Browns organization. Then you have Brandon Weedham, the oldest first round pick in, in NFL draft history from last year, really having a shaky season. So I feel like their confidence is going to boost up uh, for the both for the both of them. I feel like. Grant Wee has, has a couple of great wide receivers, and Greg Little and Josh Cribbs. Both guys can improve and possibly become pro bowlers. And Brandon Whedon, you mentioned him. He was hired as or was drafted as the oldest player coming out of that draft, a 27 years old coming into the draft. And he was taken in the first round by the Cleveland Browns. I mean, this is what makes the Browns the Browns. They do stuff like this, and that's why they are towards the bottom. They haven't gone to a playoff game in almost two decades. It shows their futility on that organization for so many years. It has been the other way around for San Diego. This is not very familiar territory for them. For the very first time in about six or seven years, the San Diego Chargers enter the offseason following a losing record, a 7-9 and nine campaign. They hire former offensive coordinator of the Denver Broncos, Mike McCoy, just a few days ago. And I can go more in depth on this. I mean, he was a he re- really helped reconstruct that Broncos offense to Tim T. Debo last year made one of the worst quarterbacks ever uh, into a playoff uh, QB, and they also uh, made Peyton Manning into a 13-3 uh, quarterback, and the offense was not the problem in the playoffs as well last week. Robert Dieters, back over to you. What are your thoughts on a new hiring in San Diego, their 15th head coach, Mike McCoy? He's now in the booth uh, at uh, head coach. You know, I think Mike McCoy can uh, get the job done. You know, um, Bryce, I know you're a Chargers fan, but North Turner did horrible, horrible coaching. And, you know, finally getting Mike McCoy, um, he's actually a California native. Interesting fact there. So I think this guy will do well. And, uh, you know, especially he's already had a job in the NFL. So, you know, he has some experience. Over to Chicago side, we switch from coast to coast. They were a very hot team nearing the playoffs, but bogged down for the second straight year following a 7-1 and mark. And they finished the year at 10-6. and six, And Chicago says 10-6 and six is not going to be – it's not what we're expecting. And they – completely clean that head coach position and they hire a guy by the name of Mark Trestman. I don't know if you know more about this, Stephen, but uh, at very early on January 16th, apparently at four in the morning, that was when they hired this new head coach. Chicago Bears, they are already a pretty good football team with a quarterback for the future. What are your thoughts on this hiring? And in my mind, the most head scratching of them all. And I agree with you right there. Head scratching call. Really, you're hiring a CFL coach who does not know the real NFL. CFL and NFL are two extremely different games in a way because the CFL field is is even different than the NFL field. So obviously, you pretty much have an inexperienced coach coming in to the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears are looking for offense, but they trust Mark. They trust Mark into leading. Uh, the Bears to a better offensive game than Levy Smith, who is more on the defensive side of the ball, and that's that's how that's how the Bears are successful. Their defense is the reason why they've been so uh, successful for so many years, led by very old veteran Brian Erlacher and also Lance Briggs. But the Bears are starting to lead towards the offensive game. They have a good running back in Mike Forte. They have a good wide receiver in Brandon Marshall, and then they have a decent quarterback who's shaky a lot, and that's Jay Cutler. So. Obviously, the Bears could use some help on both ends now because uh, the linebackers, like I mentioned, Erlacher and Briggs are starting to get old. So, honestly, Trustman is going to be hopefully the next uh, the next coach that really leads this Bears team both offensively and defensively. You mentioned earlier on that the college ranks, as far as a field goes, as far as a scheme, philosophy, doesn't really translate to the NFL. Similar situation. Let's not look farther than our own uh, our own nation here. The college ranks, NCAA versus the NFL. There's a lot of schematic things in college that uh, was quote unquote un. Uh, 
doesn't really translate to the NFL ranks. Chip Kelly is hired as the new Philadelphia Eagles head coach, and controversy follows this coach more than any other hiring uh, so far this offseason. And that was the fact that uh, Chip Kelly, he runs a spread sort of option uh sort of option passing game the only most comparable offense that does anything like that is the new england patriots it's a spread them out kind of scheme uh, where they have a quarterback on a rollout situation uh, michael vick former eagle a quarterback is obviously one of those qbs that can fit that scheme somewhat well but a lot of people believe that chip kelly his scheme does not fit the pro game we turn it over to robert Dieters. what are your thoughts on a philadelphia hiring that could to me really backfire on a team that has went to the super bowl just a few years ago and andy reed is out of town following five nfc championship game appearances with this eagle squad you know rice you know chip kelly's not ready for this the eagles have just had bad luck, you know, just not, they have not been good at all. And, you know, you know, Michael Vick, I don't know if he'll be returning, but this quarterback, well, they have a really bad quarterback situation. Nick Foles was okay. He was okay, but they need a QB that can really step it up. They have LaShawn McCoy, who's a good running back. They have, hmm, I'm just, it's just like the team isn't, they're just disorganized. They don't have, Anything going for him, especially with Andy Reid gone. Andy Reid was a guy that you could trust as a head coach. Now, when you look at Chip Kelly, he's coming from Oregon. And, you know, yeah, you said college scheme is different. Yes, it is. And when you look at it, NFL and college are both different. So when you look at it, Chip Kelly, I don't think will be a good head coach. And he'll be probably fired within the two years. On a different spectrum, Gus Bradley, for, former Seattle defensive coordinator, in my regard, was the best defensive mind available for either of these teams looking for a head coach. Seattle was turned just from one year ago, bottom half in defense, into a top five squad that many could regard as a better defense overall than a team like San Francisco. That's one game away from the Super Bowl due to its powerful defense. Jacksonville uh, hires this Gus Bradley defensive mind from uh, Seattle and in my mind will help that Jacksonville team have a sense of urgency and a sense of toughness. Steven, do you agree? I think um, he, does bring, he does bring some experience into, uh, into Jacksonville. Just He did a good job in Seattle. I feel like this year was the year that Seattle really broke out as the defensive team. Uh, to compare with uh, the Niners and with the Ravens. And those two teams have been just consistently over the last few years the top defensive teams with their leaders. Well, Gus, yeah, like you said, Gus Bradley brings defense uh, to the mind f for the Jaguars, and they kind of need that. The offense led by Maurice Jones-Drew is pretty good, but they still have a quarterback issue. Brian Gabber is not really that good. Chad Henney, who was picked up by from, my, uh, from free agency, was picked up. During for the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he did pretty good. But I feel like the Jaguars in the draft will need to get a a consistent everyday starter, uh, a starting quarterback, and I feel like this is going to be the best thing for the Jaguars. And you know the defense, the defensive mind is going to be great, but uh, I think that both need a huge improvement. And this Jaguars team is going to be a rebuilding project, and it might take at most five years to fully rebuild and become a possible playoff contender. Whether you're tick, uh, picking up a former offensive or defensive coordinator or a former CFL head coach or a former coordinator at college or in these NCAA ranks as a coach, you always are taking a risk. You're always having that little doubt in your mind that this scheme, this philosophy with this uh, man leading your football team, giving them the keys to your franchise, it could turn around and backfire. And that was the case with Kansas City and Romeo Cornell that turned from bad to worse in just one year. Arizona, I believe, with a head coach, former head coach, Ken Wisenhunt, that really helped resurrect that team in his first few years, turn that team into a 30 seconds away from winning the Super Bowl caliber team, and now they, they're just heads went straight to the floor after an 11-game losing streak. Now they hire Bruce Arians, and I mentioned 
uh, franchises that have no clue in some cases what they're doing. I believe the safest pick out of all of these teams was Bruce Arians. Now, I don't mention safe in the same regard as he's not going to be a solid head coach. I believe Bruce Arians will be one of the top two or three head coaches of these eight hirings in a matter of moments. This guy turned the Colts from the worst team in the NFL into a 9-3 and three mark under the helm. Bruce Arians is a definite tough competitor. Uh, just watch his uh, battle from cancer. Not only Chuck Pagano, but also Bruce Arians has been suffering from cancer as well. And they turned that franchise around in just one year. Robert Dieters, what do you th- uh, think about this new hiring? I believe the safest hiring, but in my mind, the most effective for this Arizona team that really needs some desperation at the very top of the head coach. Yeah, I agree with you, Rice. And, you know, the Cardinals were competitive until on week five, and then they just got a huge losing streak going for them. And then when you know they're they're all the way down, they were top and then went all the way down. They're in contention with the Niners. Now, this team could turn around. They really need an O-line. They probably, I mean, Skeleton was sacked so many times. And when you look at it, I think the O-line just needs to, I think that O-line needs to improve. And I think you don't give the defense enough credit for the Cardinals. They did okay. But, you know, they can have a little minor adjustments. I think they could be one of the best defense in the league, especially Bruce Arians. You know, he was the interim coach. And this guy already has experience. He went 9-3. and three as you said, with the Colts. And this is probably the one of the best pickups you can get. Obviously, Bruce Arians, you got to be a fan of a guy that turned that franchise around in just one season. And obviously, it's a testament to also that toughness of that football team. It's very under, underestimated. You know, it's a team, or it's a league of with a football team, you're looking for talent accumulation. You're looking for how much talent you can put on a football field. Indianapolis is one of those few exceptions where they're not a talented team, but can flat out uh, take it to you. And they took it to 11 teams throughout the entire NFL, posting an 11-5 and five mark. Obviously very impressive. Arizona will improve in a hurry. Out of these eight teams, these eight head coaching hires, who do you believe was the winner and loser? We'll start with Stephen Hughes. It's obviously tough to tell at this point, but who do you believe was the winner off of uh, you know these eight head co- or eight teams that acquire these new head coaches? Uh, I think the winner is, like you said, uh, the Arizona Cardinals hiring the best available uh, head coaching job pretty much is Bruce Arians. What a he did a tremendous job leading the Colts, especially when without their coach Chuck Pagano. And what he did to lead the Colts is probably never going to be seen again. Just having uh, just an offensive corner come in for a coach who's battling leukemia and just lead a team into a playoff berth that's not going to be seen probably ever again. But obviously he was the best available and I feel like the Carlos made the best decision going on the offensive end because they needed help on with the quarterbacks. Obviously it's inconsistency, inconsistency over in Arizona with their quarterback. And their defense is decent. They could get better. But I feel like the Carlos need to focus on the offensive side of the ball. Loser is what I mentioned, uh, the Chicago Bears. They really hired the worst out of all candidates pretty much. Mark Tressman really does not belong in the NFL. And even though he seemed like the best candidate out of the CFL, I feel like Lovey Smith would be a better leader for the Chicago Bears team than Mark Trestman. So the winners, the Cardinals, the losers are the Bears. But hopefully I feel like the Cardinals can do the best and make an impact in the now very competitive NFC West. And the Bears, I can see them at the bottom of the NFC North very soon. Uh, Steven, you took my fire there. I was going to give Robert Dieters a chance to give him his loser. Obviously, uh, Robert Dieters is linked to losing more than anyone else. I'm just playing. But, um, uh, Robert, winner and loser real quick here on the two head coaching uh, hirings. One you believe was the best out of the available coaching positions and the other that was flat out not the decision to be made. Well, the best decision, I think, was um, Andy Reid for Kansas City Chiefs. I think he could turn this team around. I think this team will be playoff contenders. And, uh, you know, they got the QB situation, but I think Andy Reid could get that under control. Um, let's, see, my, let's see. My loser is probably going to have to be the Philadelphia Eagles. Chip Kelly will not be ready for the NFL. 
and I think the Eagles will go 3-13. and Obviously, it's tough to tell right off the bat who really uh, turned their team around with a head coaching hire that was extremely impressive. It's tough to tell, and I, I believe a lot of people uh, with the Chuck Pagano situation would have not expected that, a one-year resurrection. Uh, just a real quick uh, prediction here. I believe that, that the winner of all these teams, I, I mean, for the losing side, I have to believe with Steven. I mean, just the, the fact that you go to the CFL, the Co- uh, Canadian Football League, to reach for a guy uh, that is replacing one of the best in the league last year in Lovey Smith. In my mind, a terrible hire. And the best was the Arizona Cardinals. They really needed help with that head coaching position, and they got it. They have their head coach, without a doubt. Uh, the rest of these teams, there's a level of uncertainty. Arizona has their coach for the next five, ten years. He's a hardworking guy that gets it done on the field. We'll be right back to the NFL tonight. Stephen Hughes and Robert Dieters and your host, Nick Rice, are just getting started here at the NFL tonight. It's a January 19th evening. Uh, we are here live in California to bring you everything around the National Football League. Ravens and the Patriots in the AFC Championship and the Niners and the Falcons battling for a spot in Super Bowl 47. We'll break it down for you and a couple upsets in this matchup. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the NFL tonight. We are here live on a January 19th evening, and we've had a very uh, clean show so far here on the NFL tonight. Stephen Hughes and Robert Teeters are joining us, and the NFL is just getting started with perhaps two of the best uh, matchups of, I mean, we start the year, and we believe that from the AFC, from the very start, New England looked to be the best team in that conference. You could debate that De- the Denver Broncos perhaps was, uh, was the second best, but nobody was really doubting that New England was uh, the best team in this conference. And over in the NFC, for a while, it was, it, it was anyone's game. It was one week. Uh, Seattle was the best team in this conference. The other week it was Atlanta, San Francisco. You really didn't know what team was the best in this conference. Even Green Bay, a team that the Niners dismantled last week, uh, even a team like Green Bay uh, was obviously regarded as one of the best in that conference. We have San Francisco and Atlanta in this conference battling for the NFC Championship in a right uh, to go to Super Bowl 47. And we are trying to recap with the best possible analysis possible. We are just hours away, partner, for the NFC Championship game. Obviously, I believe uh, Robert Dieters is the most excited here. Obviously, all three of us are pumped up and ready for this game. We'll start off with Robert. Who do you believe really will be the impact player and performance to watch in this matchup where it really, in a sense, could be anyone's game? San Francisco looks to be the more powerful team. Do you agree? I uh, well... Come on, you you know my answer, Rice. The Niners will win this one, but don't count them. Don't count out the Falcons. The Falcons, I know they're overrated, but you know when you look at this team, this team has done pretty well in the off. They have one of the best offenses in the game. Now the defense has to stop them. That's probably going to be um, the biggest challenge for the Niners. But Colin Kaepernick has done well. He has been known, and. Um, Especially with the rushing, I think he's done pretty well this year. Frank Gore has been a beast. Man, he's just he's just on fire. Uh, when we look at the receiving, now I mentioned this on your last show. Randy Moss is my player to watch. This guy can get you third down conversions. Maybe not the touchdown. You don't go for him on the touchdown plays, but this guy is still a veteran. This guy can get you some big plays. You're right, Robert. The player to watch is Randy Moss. I mean, if I've seen a guy that can drop more passes and can convert fewer third downs in the NFL, it has to be Randy Moss. Uh, Steven, do you agree? Um, I disagree. I, I, I like Randy Moss. He's one of the greatest <laughs> receivers of all time. I remember his days or his short days in, uh, in Oakland, then he went to New England. I enjoyed his presence on the field, and he's one of the best that uh, you can compare it to Jerry Rice as one of the best receivers in the game, but he's not the impact performer uh, that I'm going to look at this game. I'm going to look at Michael Crabtree. Uh, even though there's been the speculation of his allegations of sexual uh, assault uh, the day after the Niners won their game against the Packers last week, I feel like uh, Colin Kaepernick has had a lot of trust in him in the last few games. 
and especially in the uh, in the Packers game where he just went to him pretty much in every single pass, and Crabtree scores two receiving touchdowns. So I'm going to look for him to be the impact player, look for him to be the number one target for Kaepernick, uh, unless Kaepernick runs. So uh, look for Crabtree, and Randy Moss might make an impact, but not as much as I think Crabtree will. I have to totally disagree. But, I mean, obviously Michael Crabtree is the player to watch in this game. But, I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm just here to preview your matchup here between the Niners and the Falcons. I believe it's all San Francisco. But, I mean, it's hard to be that perfect role model that always has to give your information the correct way. Randy Moss is not going to be an impact in this game. I'm giving you that right now. He's closer to zero catches in this game rather than any sort of first down conversions, uh, whatever uh, whatever plays you believe he will make. Or I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I think he's the biggest liability on that team for any of the starters out there on the field. Just a flat out baller that really is at least five years past his prime. We go over to the N or AFC Championship game. Excuse me. Uh, we're um, I'm giving a little too much heated debate here on this show. Ravens and the Patriots winner to the AFC side in Super Bowl 47. This is a tale of two quarterbacks that faced off just a year ago in the AFC Championship game, and the victor was by a field goal that Tom Brady led Patriots, and that was one of those games that he was frankly outplayed now statistically Tom Brady had slightly better numbers but you could just see from the very beginning that uh, Joe Flacco had the keys to that offense and really set the igniter going when he um, he helped that team rally multiple times from deficits and he rallied them one more time before Lee Evans dropping a pass in the end zone do you believe we'll start with Steven this time that there will be a different outcome this time and how if that is the case why I feel like this is going to be a different outcome. And the reason why I say that is because this Ravens team is going to have a chip on their shoulder like they've had the entire playoffs. This is Ray Lewis's last ride in the postseason. He's going to retire. Everyone wants to win it for Ray Ray Lewis. Tom Brady has had his run. I feel like it's time for the Patriots to have their little struggle time where they, they don't even get to the playoffs one year or two years. So... The Ravens have the edge in this one. The Patriots, they had an easy one against the Texans. The Ravens, they had to fight their way against the number one team in the AFC. So I feel like the Patriots are going to be a little bit worried. They should be a little bit worried. They almost lost last year. They barely they barely got in. It was due to a missed catch in the end zone and a shanked field goal, the reason why they took on the Giants of the Super Bowl last year. So the Ravens do have the edge, in my opinion, and I think they'll win. I think that the Joe Flacco, his intensity in the playoffs is just is one of the best. You can compare it to Eli Manning. It's it's ridiculous. It's extraordinary, and the receivers that he has is just second to none. You have Anquan Bolden. You have Torrey Smith. You have Jacoby Jones coming up big on the on a receiving touchdown to tie the game last week. So, um, I got the I got the offense and the defense for Baltimore, and they're going to win this one. They're going to go to the Super Bowl. It's obviously undemated that last week the New England Patriots for the second time this year cakewalked through that Houston Texan team. It was over before the game started. Before kickoff, the Houston Texans were done. It, that game was already in the books. And even the final score doesn't really show how dominant of a game that was. A different situation for the Baltimore Ravens. And Steven, you just mentioned they battled through uh, multiple weeks trying to fight their way to get to this game. And you got to believe that Ray Lewis has some sort of fight in that whole football team. Interestingly enough, the Ray Lewis Red led Ravens are 5-5. Five and five with him on the sideline, and 7-1 and one with him on the field so far this year. And also, you mentioned 87 total snaps between two of these games. Uh, both of these games, when the Ravens played the Colts in the wildcard round and when the Ravens took on the Denver Broncos in the divisional round, 87 snaps in both of those games this defense has played. you got to think that at least they are somewhat fatigued heading into this matchup at Gillette Stadium. Uh, following a week where they had to have a quick week before going to Mile High Stadium, that altitude, 87 snaps, double overtime, uh, the fourth longest game in history. Will that, Robert uh, Dieters, will that be an impact in this game? 
And will the New England Patriots really have the edge from the get-go with the first punch of this uh, heavyweight battle for the AFC Championship? My prediction for this game is the Patriots. Sam, um, the San Mateo native Tom Brady is going to get it done. Nope. So <laughs> when you look at it, Tom Brady is going to throw the winning touchdown. Now the Ravens were close last year. Billy Cudniff missed the field goal. But <clears throat> the offense is going to get it done. I don't say Baltimore has the better defense in this one. But Patriots have one of the top offenses in the league. Now the running game for the offense is going to go to Baltimore. Because, of course, New England has no running game whatsoever. All they do is pass pretty much. Because Ridley can't do anything. But, okay. Keep going. You, you, you need to stop running. So, <laughs> what, Rice? He's what, lost. You, he's you you've lost out of steam. Uh, go ahead and finish, though. Go ahead. You, you, you had a nice run. Going to win this Super Bowl by a touchdown. New win. Tom Brady is going to throw the winning touchdown in the game. What a load! Or it's going to be a blowout. Can I make my argument? All right, go ahead, Stephen. Go ahead and blast okay, Robert look, Dieters. Okay, so for everybody who does not know Robert Dieters. He goes to Sarah High School, and who went to the same high school with Robert Dieters? Tom Brady went to Sarah with Robert Dieters, or not with him, but he went to Sarah. Obviously so not with him. The no. edge will go to the Patriots if it's in Robert's terms because the Sarah pride, hey oh. And for me, Tom Brady, he's past, he's at the edge of where, uh, you know, he's past Joe Montana's mark. But I don't think this year is going to be the year. The defense has been struggling a lot. They don't have Ron Gronkowski anymore. This is their first game. This is going to be the first playoff game without Ron Gronkowski. So that's going to be a big concern, in my opinion. And the Ravens are just too overpowering. And Ravens are going to win this game. Harbaugh Bowl is set for Super Bowl 47. I'm putting my stamp on that Super Bowl prediction right now. I don't know if you guys agree, but the Harbaugh Bowl just looks to be looks to be set. Gronkowski less New England is at home for yet another year. I mean, this is just routine for this team. But the difference is that running game is so up and down. Last year it, it was just a hundred yards a week for New England. Now this week it's very it, it's been a whole bunch of different targets. But just there's something about Baltimore that just seems to be their kind of year this year. And as for the NFC, if anyone thinks that Atlanta has a remote chance of winning this game, you are flat out mistaken. Uh, I mean, to be to be completely honest, it's a horrible bowl in the making. And I, I, I know Robert Dieters, you know, maybe uh, – I, I don't know. Maybe he uh, – Drank too much haterade this morning. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> obvious, obviously the New, the New England Patriots. I mean, there's just something about the Baltimore Ravens that I mean, if you are an anti fan of the Ravens, I I don't know. I I don't know. You know, you gotta. I, I don't. I don't know. You gotta get your vision checked, Robert. I mean, the Ravens are just the better an team. Anti hater. You're just a hater. I'm not a hater. I am a lover. You are a lover, lover of the wrong team, a lover of yeah, your mother. You're definitely lover right. of the wrong team. Are you kidding me? Okay. Okay. The Patriots are going to win. <laughs> no, they're not. Straight okay. up, and they're going to lose the Super Bowl again. You just said they're going to lose the Super Bowl. <laughs> that is, the, no, I thought oh, we were man. talking about the, the Baltimore and Patriots game. Well, you did, you're okay, an idiot. Part of, your, okay, part of your argument was that you wanted the Patriots to win because of Tom Brady. And the fact yeah, I want matter, them to win the AFC though. The, and then you said they want you wanted to you wanted to win the Super Bowl. That you said. No, I don't. Want, well, then I don't want them to win the Super. I never said okay, that. Go ahead, change your prediction right now, please. I want them to lose in the Super Bowl. I want the Niners to win and bring one home for us. All right. You're Thank you're you. predicting now that oh. I I don't know, oh, Robert. You gotta make your mind on this kind of thing. Oh man, <laughs> I'm messing around with the sound effects here. Yeah, I'm messing around with the sound effects here. I mean, if... we all love Robert Dieters, but when when his head is crooked, his head is. Oh man, his head is more. 
Oh my gosh. My head is perfect. Your head is perfect? Oh man. Oh that my right gosh. Goal, my prediction. Your head is That's more right mashed time. than Thanksgiving casserole. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. You're oh my the the New England Patriots. <sighs> oh my oh gosh. man. Oh, God. All right. This is a team of destiny, the Baltimore Ravens are, and they will prove it again. And the other thing is, um, the Denver Broncos took it to the Baltimore Ravens early on in that game because it was an early game. Now they travel to New England. It was. It's almost like a sigh of relief. They have an extra day off. Uh, New England played on Sunday. The Baltimore Ravens played on Saturday. They have an extra day to recover. Sure, they're traveling over the, to Gillette Stadium, but just the fact that it's, it's a later game gives the Baltimore Ravens more time to recover. I, I mean, I, I know that's just a mod, like just. I mean, that seem, may seem a little insignificant here, but. They also don't have Lee Evans, I believe, or Billy Cundiff anymore, two of the biggest chokers in last year's game. Hallelujah. And earlier in the year, Baltimore, I mean, New England made it close, really close. But people watching that game could see Baltimore just took it to the New England Patriots. It was close at the, towards the end, but New England, I mean, they need to watch out. They Earlier in the year, they couldn't even beat this Baltimore team. I, I mean, and I'd like to say something, Nick. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but regular season matchup, Ravens won. So that, that's that's another reason why I'm giving you giving them the edge. It's also called payback. Called payback. No, revenge. Did uh, what's it called? The Did the Houston Texans have payback on this team last week? I, I don't know. I, I didn't see I that game really because it was so out of reach. The second game in the playoffs. Well, uh. I don't know if that point's even modestly logical or reasonable. <laughs> we love ba bagging on you, Robert. I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh, my God. You know, at least I'm making a good pick with uh, the Niners. You with the Niners? Making one good pick. Making one good pick? But it's, it's still in, a close game. In the Super Bowl, when the Niners and the Ravens play for the Lombardi, who's going to win that matchup? We'll start with Steven. I'm going to go – this is going to be a really hard pick because these two teams are extremely good on the defense and the offense. And the Niners kind of boosted their uh, – they just upgraded their offenses. Like, their off yeah, they, uh, they upgraded their offense because of the move to Colin Kaepernick. And at first I hated the decision. Colin Kaepernick, oh, my God. He's a second-year quarterback in Nevada, which is only options. And, jo and Jim Harrow made it easier for him to just get into the system and – Jim Harbaugh even expanded the playbook just to make Colin Kaepernick feel more comfortable. So, I and then Joe Flacco has done great this uh, this playoffs. So, this is a hard pick, but I have to go with the Niners. I give them the edge. The defense is just a little bit better than the uh, Ravens, and the Ravens defense is a little bit older than the Niners. So, I think that's the only edge I got for this team, for the Super Bowl possibility. So, at the Niners, Robert, what do you got? Um, I got the Niners too, man. I mean, well, come the, on. I have believed Homer. in them. Homer! <laughs> we ahead. have believed in them. Me and Steven have been through their hard times. Not really. <laughs> we went to almost Alex Smith's last game in the in 2010. He was supposed to leave after the Arizona Cardinals game. Well, you do, do you enjoy Colin Kaepernick or do you really? No, I enjoy him. He's a good player. This guy has gone 6-2 since he started. Enjoy oh man, just a few weeks ago you were all for Alex Smith. Now I mean I'm bagging on you, Robert. I apologize. Well, because Alex Smith is gonna go start somewhere else, so he could be he could be fine with it. He'll win a Super Bowl okay. at least. Okay, good point. Um So he'll have a Super Bowl ring and be happy with it. Then he goes somewhere else and get a Super Bowl. I mentioned earlier on in the year, I uh, texted Robert Dieters here. We're all uh, very, very well in touch here. And obviously that has nothing to do with the, our intentions or, our, I mean, anything at that level. But um, obviously uh, Colin Kaepernick was switched to be the guy of the future. And Alex Smith was pretty much pushed off to the side. I mean, in a way you have to feel for a guy that uh, provided so much for this team. But uh, statistically, I find this interesting. Both of these quarterbacks threw 218 passes. Alex Smith completed more passes for almost as many yards and three more touchdowns and less interceptions by a mile. 
Now, people are talking about Colin Kaepernick being uh, the flat-out better quarterback, but statistically, Alex Smith has a pretty significant edge. I just find that interesting. Nothing to do with Ravens and the Niners uh, battling for the Super Bowl, but, I mean, Colin Kaepernick, the reason why they gave him the job was just flat out, he has a better ceiling. He, in this matchup, sure, he's not going to complete 60, 70% of his passes because he's a gunslinger. He's just going to fire deep, and uh, obviously, it's a battle of two gunslingers between Flacco and Kaepernick, hopefully, in the Super Bowl. I, I mean, New England has a legitimate chance. We were bagging on them just a minute ago. They have a legitimate chance. I mean, statistically, uh, they are better than the Ravens offensively in almost every category. Obviously, obviously defensively, New England is flat-out atrocious. Uh, but offensively, if the Patriots can put up 30... I don't know if Baltimore can do it back-to-back -back weeks. I, I know Flacco will have another great game. I mean, just look at last year, look at earlier this year. But it's just – it's one of those things if New England plays their game, they have a chance. And same with uh, the Atlanta Falcons. But it's one of those scenarios where despite the New England Patriots being a slight favorite, they're just – I mean, there are some teams that fans love more than others, have a flat-out affair for. I mean, people that watch Baltimore, last week it wasn't even close against Denver. Two Trendon Holiday return touchdowns kept that game even remotely close. They made Peyton Manning look like Brett Favre when he was having his final run with the New York Jets. I, I mean... The Baltimore Ravens just seem to be one of those teams that are flat out destined for something. I mean, it was the New Orleans Saints after the, um, not scandals, but after Hurricane Katrina in 2009. I mean, it's just sometimes that you just, for a lot of people, a lot of human people, obviously Robert Dieters does not fit that category, but you have to, <laughs> you have to root for a fit for a team like Baltimore that has gone through so much and i have to agree with you there i think that this is the ravens year you know back in back when they were playing in the super bowl against the giants back in i think it was 2000 they had a chip on their shoulder because ray lewis was one the leader and two that was the year that ray lewis was accused of uh, his murder the murder that they quote unquote accused him of but really he wasn't a part of it but they had a chip on their shoulder. They were going to win it for him and to, you know, help out and try to win back his reputation with the people around the Ravens and the media and all that stuff. Now they're doing it for Ray Lewis again, but this time it's for his final run, like I said earlier. And, you know, even they're going to win the, the, the AFC title game. But for them to really win the Super Bowl, they will need to have extraordinary defense being able to not just contain Colin Kaepernick, but contain, uh, contain him with a complete, superb excellence, pretty much. You don't know what he's doing. The Packers, who could have obviously t uh, done good against Alex Smith if he was starting, could not stop Colin Kaepernick at all from the from from which he was doing the read options and the play-action shotgun plays, and he's just buying open hole and run, so... And then the offense needs to be a little bit better. Fuck us to be a touch better than how he's doing right now. So, you know, the Ravens is possible, but, you know, it's going to be hard for them to uh, to get really something started against a Niners team that looks destined to get that Super Bowl that they've wanted for so many years. A quick 30 seconds between both of you. I didn't ask you guys for the AFC side, but who do you believe will be the player to watch? We start with Robert Dieters in the AFC championship game. It's Baltimore and New England winner to the Super Bowl. Um, the player to watch for is Buzz Walker for the Patriots. This guy could catch, and I think this guy will do pretty well for the team. Um, I think this guy can uh, really step up his game and uh, help out Tom Brady a lot. This guy can catch. Look at last year's Super Bowl. A drop to win that game. Oh, uh, that, that wait, yeah. let's burn, about that. burn. Let's about All right, that. let's go, Stephen. Who do you have? Uh, for this for for this AFC towel game, my impact player, the key player to watch in this game, is Joe Flacco. 
he needs to have a great game. He needs to have consistency throughout the entire year. But if he was playing in the playoffs the way he played in the regular season, then we are not talking about the Ravens in, in, in the AFC title game. We're talking about the Broncos and the Patriots in the AFC title game. If Joe Fico plays in the, regular, uh, in the playoffs like he did in the regular season, what he's done in the playoffs has been great. He's he's won a playoff game in each of his five seasons. That's no one has ever done that. Maybe one or two people have done that. He's won he's won a couple of road playoff games, and he has the advantage of that. Tom Brady he's had the advantage of having the Patriots at home for for most of the playoff games that he's been playing for. So you know, look for him. Look for Joe Flacco to be the key guy to lead this Ravens offense to New Orleans and to the Mercedes-Benz Superdome and a berth into the Super Bowl. Uh, Stephen Hughes, Robert Dieters, and Nick Rice all on tap here in the NFL tonight. We are wrapping it up here just a final a few storylines following a quick 30-second commercial break. We'll be right back to the NFL tonight with Monte Teo reactions and also a trip to that ever, uh, ever controversial uh, situation with Lance Armstrong. It's unrelated to the NFL tonight, but we'll real quickly bring up those topics. What do we think about uh, the scandal and the fallout around Teo and Lance Armstrong? Quick 30-second break. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back here to the NFL tonight. Stephen Hughes and Robert Dieters, along with your host Nick Rice, all on tap here on the NFL tonight. We are simulcast live on Spreaker.com's National Sports. We're just wrapping up a few quick moments here uh, to bring up the hottest topics of the night. Uh, so far uh, this year, January has been marked by controversy. Monte Teo, uh, the fallout there, he said he was unrelated, uninvolved with the girlfriend hoax, a four-month-long relationship, quote-unquote, that was ended in a, a death by that girlfriend that ended up not being not being a death, but it was somebody else impersonating as the girlfriend, and the girlfriend uh, was just on a Facebook page, and the Facebook page was all that Montateo has for evidence, but he said he wasn't involved. He said he was talking to another girl. I mean... With, with all the stuff going around, it makes the movie Inception look simple. I, I mean, my goodness. A, a phone call gets Monte Teo interested in a four-month-long relationship. R real quick, guys, what are your thoughts on this situation? I, I mean, th does this seem pretty ridiculous to you? It does to me. Well, Monte Teo, one of the uh, more... The more the, most inspirational player in this college football year. Usually, usually there's once there's one or nine, and not a lot, you know, a season. But Manti Taylor was the key inspiration for college football this year, and that pretty much damaged it. That pretty much the hoax that everybody is on. Uh, that was everybody was supporting him because of what happened to his grandmother. And then six hours later, his supposed girlfriend die too but that's that really hurt his reputation and some people were worried that that would hurt his draft stock, his draft stock at the same time and i first from some gms that it's not it's not gonna hurt him but if they did at the nfl level then they'll lose a lot of trust in him so obviously do uh, do that once he gets past uh, gets passed by do that twice and then you're in big trouble so this isn't a big. Uh, this isn't a big deal because he really didn't do. It. I wouldn't see him really doing this ever because he's that type of guy. But you know, hopefully, it doesn't happen again. And he makes smart decisions. Obviously, and this really puts ESPN and all of these uh, broadcasting teams. It puts them at fault for putting these players. Obviously, people are suckers for success, and ESPN. Uh, NFL Network, I mean, any sports channel, does a tremendous job, and at sometimes it's really to blame. They put them at, they put these players at these kind of pedestals, and Lance Armstrong wins five Tour de France awards, winning all of these races, being the best biker ever to live, resurrecting this new sport of biking, and it really. Uh, helped this this man. I mean, he put almost a billion dollars into charity as well. A, mil a million or a billion? I mean, I, I think it's a billion dollars. But 
I mean, boy, I don't even have the facts straight. But the point is, uh, Lance Armstrong put so much money into charity, was one of the most well-rounded and respected. It, it, I mean, it looked that way. Uh, you know, bike, or, I mean, flat-out sports figures around, and he was the best at a sport, and now he's looked as a cheater. I mean, if Monte Teo is presumably a hoax and a flat-out liar to the public, I mean, Lance Armstrong totally deceives all of America for seven years about his lack of doping. And then not only does he um, finally commit to, hey, I was the I was at fault here. I was uh, cheating for all of these years, but he does it with such a lack of care and a lack of intention for all of the people that he's hurt, all of the lives that he's affected. I mean. Robert, does this just seem like, I, I mean, does it just seem like a disrespect to the sport of biking? And does this really uh, take a hit on all of these players that really start being assumed as, oh, he's great, uh, he, he does steroids, you know, he's a cheater. I mean, does this really affect the game or is it just a rare instance that we'll, uh, we'll very soon forget in the coming days? Um, well, you know, you feel bad for this guy that, you know, he had to actually admit this on national TV on the Offer and Wimpery show, and he had to say that, uh, you know, <laughs> he had to say, you know, that I admit to do it during the, uh, you know, during the race, the Tour de France is kind of sad, and, and I, you know, I feel bad for the guy, but he did do it. I mean, obviously, Lance Armstrong is put at a huge public discrimination. He's already accused and finally admits to cheating. But, I mean, what really hits me, what really irritates not only me, but I'm sure a lot of people is, I don't have the audio clip here, but at one point during the Oprah Winfrey interview, if you guys didn't uh, hear, he brought up the definition of cheating as a intentional cause for an advantage over your competitors. And Lance Armstrong says that's not what he did. And, I, I mean, once you hear that, what? Excuse me? And, and I really don't have an explanation for why he would believe after all these years that he was not a cheater. It just shows the person that he is, which is a flat-out shame to be one of the greatest at your sport and not have the common courtesy to at least admit to, your, to the public. You had seven years to forgive and forget. Seven years to forgive about your cheating and to flat-out admit to the public that you had a wrongdoing. I mean, am I right at some uh, at some level, Stephen, in this argument? I think you are. I was watching uh, big chunks of the interview, and then I was listening to reactions from uh, on CNN, ESPN, just a lot of places, just seeing how they feel about the situation. And some people are surprised that he hasn't said more than what he said already, and that shocked me a little bit. And then when I'm starting to think about it, I started to realize that he should say a little bit more. He's disrespected the sport of cycling and really hurt the opportunity, uh, really hurt the sport a lot. Just, Robert, stop. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just the fact that, um, you know, he did this and he had to come out because he lost. He lost everything. He lost his glory. He lost being the founder, the head guy. He, he, he didn't really lose it, but he lost being the board of the Livestrong Foundation. He lost his seven Tour de France's. He lost his bronze medal from the Olympics back when he was in the Olympics and he won the bronze. But he lost everything, and he had to come clean. But maybe it wasn't the right time to come clean. Maybe he had to do it. For the, uh, for the it's for the cycling community, not just for not just to Oprah Winfrey and to just air it out like just to anyone. They need he I think he needed to target that apology to the people that he hurt, to the people who gave him money to win the Tour de France, and to the cycling association for the United States in a way. After seven years, seven Tour de France is won, and all of the success. I, I, I feel for a guy that had all of that taken away, whether he was a cheater or not. But, 
In some cases, I mean, some people believe that just the story is good enough for a person to be okay with something. After all of this cheating and all these lives that were affected following his fallout of of finally being charged for doping and everything, I I mean, just a sorry is not good enough. He doesn't show the gratitude that... And some people, I, I mean, it's obviously a shame, but some people are just better at lying. Some people are just great at deceiving people and not telling the truth. I know a few of these guys personally that are that kind of character. Some people are just great at, at um, lying and flat out deceiving. And this does cost, this does prove a cost to all sports as there will be more and more money spent to uh, be on the lookout for people cheating, which is a flat out shame to people that don't cheat and have severe pay cuts in their paycheck. Obviously, sports uh, athletes, they are paid woefully more than the average American. But, I mean, it's just a shame that so much effort has to be spent to prevent these guys from doing such a terrible thing as to cheat at your own sport, giving yourself an edge over everyone else. I mean, how would you feel being the competitor that's playing fair and just doesn't win due to cheating? I mean, just imagine being uh, the 18 teams that the Patriots beat during that uh, Spygate scandal with, or not Spygate, but the uh, doing the video game uh, camera scandal. I mean, I, I'm going way off topic here. But uh, NFL tonight is wrapping up here. Uh, any final thoughts, guys, following a conference championship game preview, coaching carousel, and everything around the National Football League here on this uh, tremendous January 19th evening? Um, you know, good luck to the four teams that are participating in their respective conference championship games. And um, it's, uh, it's been a good ride, you know. It's been really fun doing these shows, and uh, just the fact that uh, we've been doing them as long as we have is uh, really fun. And this could possibly be our second to last show, and then we'll do we'll probably do a show for the Super Bowl. But um, you know, good luck to the teams, and um, you know, and then we're also talking about the uh, Manti Teo situation, the Lance Armstrong. Hopefully, uh, Lance Armstrong regains uh, his confidence and. Just a little bit of respect. And for Manti, it's just one uh, one little obstacle because you're just going to have a tremendous NFL com- career, in my opinion, for whatever team you're going to play for. And uh, Robert has a little something to uh, wrap up the show. So um, let's get started, Nick. Uh, well, obviously, it will give a little recap here. Robert Dieters uh, and Stephen Hughes, both with their predictions, they both believe that San Francisco will make the Super Bowl. But in the AFC... Uh, we are split here. Stephen Hughes predicts that the Ravens will make the Super Bowl, and Robert Dieters predicting that the Patriots will make it. Uh, I mean, not true. And then he believes that Randy Moss will be the key to the game. And then he believes that obviously the Patriots are far and better than the Baltimore Ravens. Oh, geez, we have a failure on the set. Thank you guys for watching NFL Tonight, and we will see you next week in NFL Tonight to bring you the recaps of the conference championship games will be next week. And uh, NFL Tonight will be Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week. Oakland Raiders. We are that Thank mm-hmm. you.